Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Jeremiah 32 is rather a long chapter, but the essence of it is not very detailed. It is a chapter that concludes the book of Consolation, which is a like a little pearl in the midst of the blackness of judgment and exile and horror and death that, uh, that Babylon is going to bring on the people of God. Jeremiah has the privilege in the last day, uh, if I could date chapter 32 for you, it would be in 588 B.C. Now, from what I've told you before about Jeremiah, what is so significant about 588 B.C., do you think? Anybody remember? This is the final siege of the city of Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar destroys it in 587. So in the last dark hours, the gasping breaths of the nation of Judah... Jeremiah is going to do one of the most uh, symbolic acts of hope, trust, and faith uh, that is anywhere in the Bible. Again, in this chapter, Jeremiah is going to present the message in symbolism. He's going to perform an act that seems ridiculous, and yet in, in the light of those around him, it had great meaning. As you know, Jeremiah used to gripe at God because all he had was a message of judgment. That's not exactly true. For in chapter 1, God says, I have called you to tear down and to destroy, but I have also called you to plant and build up. And in this chapter, we see the fulfillment of that promise where Jeremiah gets to turn the tables now. He's preached judgment. He's preached doom. He's preached destruction. But the, when the destroyer is at the door, he starts preaching hope, deliverance, return, faith. And uh, it's just characteristics of the prophets of God to do that. Now let's look, if we could, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now some people say, obviously, we have a, his, have a dating problem here, but if you remember... The people in Judah followed the, the Syrian kind of calendar dating and not and Babylon. And oftentimes in the Bible we get a confusion over the dates because there was a different way of reckoning rules. Some reckoned rules from the first full year. Others dated the rules of kings from when they ascended the throne. And that first part of the year was kind of as a full year. And that's why there's some... Uh, disagreement over these days. These fully coincide historically from all we know from uh, documents outside the Bible. What is happening here, I think, is probably clear in verse 2 when it says, And now at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard, which is in the house of the king of Judah. Now if you'll turn over me to chapter 20, 37 real quick, I think we'll get the setting Chapter 37 is the exact same time, the exact same account, uh, but a little more specific about what's happening. Uh, let's see if I can find... Okay, look at verse 4 where it says, Now Jeremiah was still coming in and going out among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison, while Pharaoh's army had set out from Egypt. And when the Chaldeans, who had been besieging Jerusalem, heard the report about them... They lifted the siege from Jerusalem. Now, what's happening is this siege apparently lasted two and a half years. Jerusalem was an extremely well-fortified city. She had internal water supplies from the time of David. And so she, if she had food supplies, she could last. And it was on a, a uh, hill. Uh, there were valleys all around it, which was very good protection. It took a long time for armies to defeat this city. It took David years and years to get the Jebusites off this place. And uh, so it lasted a long time. Well, they were building siege ramps. You ever have seen pictures of Masada? You saw how the Romans built a siege ramp. They just kept putting dirt and dirt and dirt, and they filled it up and filled it up. Finally, a ramp went all the way to the top of the wall. That's what they're doing at Jerusalem. They're building a ramp up to the wall. 
Well, after about, I don't know how many months exactly, the army had been besieging Jerusalem for a good period of time. And Egypt brought their army and started moving toward Palestine. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, heard that the Egyptian army was coming, he broke off the siege of Jerusalem for several weeks and went to meet the Egyptians. And we know from history the Egyptians never engaged the Babylonian army. It did scare them, though, and they did let the city of Jerusalem go for a while. So there was a number of weeks of freedom. And apparently, Jeremiah, as you're going to see this whole chapter, is about him buying a field from one of his relatives. Apparently, he was going out of the city of Jerusalem to Anathoth, about three miles away, and he was going to divide the property or buy this field back. One of the captains of the guards at the gates of the city of Jerusalem saw him leaving heading toward Anatoth, thought he was, surrend- thought he was uh, uh, going over to the enemy, they arrest him and put him in jail. And so we find all of this in chapter 37, though in chapter 32 it's a very brief account. We don't have all the background to it. So we see the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard. That's where they put him. Now apparently this was a place where they kept prisoners with some limited freedom. It wasn't like the lowest dungeon. They're going to put Jeremiah in the lowest dungeon. They call it a cistern pit. And one of of those he was in, we find in chapter 38, was empty of water but still had mud in it. And they threw him in there hoping that he would sink in the mud and die. But I don't know how deep he sunk. he He didn't sink deep enough to die. But he's not there yet. He's still got limited freedom. He's in the courtyard. And look where he is. In the king of Judah which is not unusual for the palace, part of the palace, to be used as a um, minimal security prison. That's the kind of prisoner uh, Jeremiah is. Now, it's probably surprising he's back in prison because his prediction about the king of Babylon has come true. One deportation has already taken place. Uh, The city is still intact, but Ezekiel's gone, Daniel's gone, Thousands of the uh, artisans and the political leaders and the priests, they're all gone to Babylon. They've been there for years. Uh, but still, they won't listen to Jeremiah's message. They're still uh, holding on to these political alliances with Egypt and that kind of thing. So, in verse 3 we see, And Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm about to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, did not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but he shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye. The king's recounting say, why, why do you preach sermons like this? Don't you have any positive word to say? Haven't you ever read Norman Vincent Peale? Don't you get the Guidepost magazine? You know, what's the matter with you, Jeremiah? You're just a, you're just a mully grubber. You're always down, always preaching gloom. And Jeremiah looks him in the eye and says, Everything I said, the Lord told me. It's going to happen. Now, this little phrase, face to face and eye to eye, is historically fulfilled in 2 Kings 25, 4 through 7. We find that in A.D. 587, B.C. 587, when they finally breached the walls of the city of Jerusalem, that King Zedekiah and most of his army ran out the other direction. But they captured him at Jericho, took him to Nebuchadnezzar, who was camped at Riblah. They got all of his children, all the Davidic line. He was the last Davidic ruler. They killed his sons before his eyes and then put his own eyes out, put him in chains, took him to Babylon, never to return. And so Zedekiah paid the price of this vacillating deal that he went through. Um, <clears throat> Verse 6 starts a new paragraph. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle. Now notice it says there, your uncle, in verse 7. Look down in verse 8. Hamuel, your uncle's son. Then look down again at verse 12. Hanamel, my uncle's. Now, does your Bible have the word son in verse 12 in, in italics? It's slightly slanted. It's out of the regular norm. What does that mean? 
It's not in the Hebrew text. Now, one of two things could possibly be here. A copyist, and all we have is copies of this, a copyist left the word sun out in verse 12. Or the Hebrew word uncle has a wider meaning than it does for us and simply means a close relative instead of the set relation it has in English. Something's happened here. The text has lost a word or the word means more than we normally think of uncle because he's called his uncle's son in one verse. In the same, same chapter, he's called the uncle. And so uh, here's a good example of some of the textual problems we face when you really get serious with exegetical work instead of just spouting platitudes. <laughs> now, notice what it mentions here. Verse 7, uh, this, this man came to him saying, Buy for yourself my field, which is at Anathoth, and you have the right of redemption to buy it. Here is Jeremiah, the doom speaker, the, the guy that always seems to be down in the mouth about judgment, becomes the supreme optimist. What would you think about someone who paid full price for a piece of land in a town that was about to fall to the enemy? <laughs> it's a symbol. Now, when it says the right of redemption, that goes back to Leviticus 25, 25 through 32. About, it's called, uh, in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, 1 and 2, it's what Boaz does to Ruth. He redeems from another kinsman the right to marry Ruth. He is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, the closest living kin that has the potential for redeeming his family. Now, what's happened? This guy has either uh, somehow lost his, his property through debts or he wants just to sell it and get away. We don't know. But he comes to Jeremiah. Now, isn't it funny that the, his hometown relatives have tried to kill him, have been against him? This man may have been one of them. But suddenly he comes to Jeremiah in prison and says, Buy my field. You're the next in line. Buy my field. The Septuagint says you're the oldest, which means he was the next in line. The Masoretic text just says you have the right of redemption. You'd think that'd be so dumb, but see, God had talked to Jeremiah earlier. This guy was going to come. And he said, Jeremiah, buy the field. So here's what happened. And Hamuel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for you have the right of possession, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Look at this next little phrase. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Now that is such a helpful thing to me. It reminds me theologically of Exodus chapter 3. When God met Moses at the burning bush, God spoke to Moses and God told him who his name was and God gave him the staff that changed into a snake, all of that. Finally, God said to Moses, You will know for certain that I am the God that called you out of Egypt when you bring the people to me at this mountain. Which was saying, which sounds funny to us, and God spoke to him and all these miracles happened and with leprosy, remember his hand and all that. God said, you won't know for sure until you bring the people to this mountain. Well, here's Jeremiah. God had told him that one of his relatives were going to come to him in prison and sell him the property and he was to buy it. And this little phrase says, Jeremiah knew that this was the word of the Lord after it happened. Now here is here an insight into the prophets of the Old Testament. They had to live as much by faith as you and I have to live. He was not absolutely certain until after it came about that it was truly God. Now think with me, what, what was that saying? That saying these prophets walked by faith as much as we do. As Moses had to walk by faith until he got that people of Israel back at Sinai, Jeremiah, though God spoke to him. Now that tells me, first of all, God didn't speak audibly to him. God spoke audibly. There wouldn't be any, doubt, any faith involved. He wouldn't have any doubt that it was God speaking. And apparently God had spoken many times very specifically. But when it came to pass, he said, Then I knew, which tells me that many times these prophets spoke on intuitiveness that was later confirmed. That's a, that's a very important verse, last part of verse 8. And I bought the field, which is the Anathoth, from 
Hamuel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out for silver for him 17 shekels of silver. That's not very much. Now, we, it's hard to put in that day and time the price of money. I guess it's very small for the price of land, uh, but apparently the whole symbolism is it was the normal price. Of, it doesn't say how big a field this guy had. He may have had a desert plot. I don't know what he had, but this seems to be normal uh, peacetime price. Seventeen shekels of silver is really not much silver at all. But we, there's no way for us to, to know the a, a monetary equivalent in our day. So, next few verses go through a real strange thing that we have found archaeologically to be absolutely historically true. And let me, let me go over it quickly. I think it's significant. I signed and sealed the deed and called a witness and weighed out the silver on the scales. There was no coins then. You did it by weight. Then I took the deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy. Now, that, that we have found exactly to be true. In Assyrian documents and in Elephantine papyri in Egypt, we have found that it was the normal thing for business transactions, sales of property, to do it twice. To do it on a piece of papyri, to leave a blank place in the middle, to wrap up the top one, punch holes in it, put strings around it, seal those strings, and leave the bottom copy open. The bottom copy was an exact duplicate that anybody could check the stipulations on. The sealed copy was the proof, the legal proof, that was set aside in the hall of records, so to speak. I guess because of the, of the days in which Jeremiah lived, he knew the... He knew the he was going to fall, he puts both copies. Look what he says. I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch. Now, this is the first mention in the book of Jeremiah, this very important scribe or disciple of Jeremiah. Baruch is the uh, follower of Jeremiah who stayed with him through thick and thin, who recorded his words, who I believe edited the book, put together his sermons. This is the first mention of him. Now, in the sight of Hamuel, my uncle's... And, the word son's not there. And in the sight of witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who were sitting, look, in the court of the guard. Can you imagine what that court must have, that those prisoners must have thought, and those guards must have thought, and those soldiers must have thought, when dummy Jeremiah pays, pays full market price for a field three miles from Jerusalem when the, when the Babylonian army has got the siege thing halfway built up the wall and they're coming back and dum-dum buys the field? Now, they may have laughed at him and just thought how stupid, but to those who are hearing the words that Jeremiah speaks about hope and return and better days are coming, that was a tremendous act of faith. Historically, there's one other instance of this recorded by Levi, who, or Levi, who is a Roman historian, that when Hannibal came across the Alps with all the elephants and put siege to the city of Rome, he captured a slave, and the slave said that one major part of the city of Rome, right in the middle of Hannibal's uh, besieging place, was sold for full market price. And you see what that is, a tremendous encouragement to an embattled population. Now, Rome was trusting in her military might, Jeremiah is trusting in the promises of God. And so he buys the field. And I commanded Baruch in, in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, this sealed deed of purchase and the open deed, put them in an earthen jar that they may last a long time. How many of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? 1947, Qumran. This is exactly how they were preserved. I was reading a book that uh, Max Martin gave me on uh, the Gnostic Gospels that are found at a, at a site uh, called, right across my head, I think it's Nag Hammadi, I've forgotten exactly, but anyway, some Arab guys were digging around by a big boulder, just digging around looking for soil to put on their field, and they found an earthen jar a foot long, sealed. They broke that and found 50 papyri uh, in leather. It was, it was Gnostic Gospels from around the first century. They had stayed without any 
any kind of, of rottingness or anything in that humidity sealed jar. The Dead Sea Scrolls were in these kind of jars, tall, tall jars, sealed with pitch, and the manuscripts are in perfect condition after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, literally almost 2,000 years. And so that's the kind of jar that Jeremiah is sealing up this in. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. And there, there again is Jeremiah's symbolic act of faith and hope in the return. In verse 16, 16 through 25 is a prayer of praise and for God and who he is. And 26 and following is God's reply. So let's look at Jeremiah's prayer. He breaks into a prayer after this. And after I'd given the deed of purchase to Baruch, uh, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God. Now, why, why is that Lord God? Did you have a little note in your margin? Every time in your Old Testament it says Lord God, you can mark it up. It's the word Adonai and the word, uh, the covenant name for God, Yahweh. It, it, it would sound funny in English to say Lord, Lord, but that's what it is. It's Lord, Lord. It's Adonai, Yahweh. And it's usually translated in English, Lord God, to make it a little different. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee. I just love Jeremiah. He, he runs the gamut of human emotions. One day he's so mad at God, he says, you're like a deceptive stream. Can't ever trust you. Next day he says, you're the maker of heaven and earth and nothing's too powerful or too hard for you to do. And notice the paradox here. You see verse 17 where he says, nothing is too difficult for you. Look how God answers over here in verse 27. He says, And God of all flesh, is anything too difficult for me? Jeremiah said it with his mouth, but he didn't believe it with his heart. <laughs> he was saying, I don't understand what you're doing, God. You know, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to use these fancy words, and I'm going to really have a neat prayer. And God finally says to him, Jeremiah, you just said nothing's too hard for me. Don't you believe what you just prayed? Isn't that just like us say words <laughs> without really thinking about the meaning? So there's... Perfect example of that. Nothing is too marvelous, and a good translation would be too difficult. Who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repayeth the iniquity of the fathers and into the bosom of their children after them. Now, this is very important. The word loving kindness is that special Hebrew word hesed. It's that covenant love, that loyalty, that faithfulness. In a context like this, it's so meaningful. Because God has said the covenant is broken because of your wickedness. Then God has said through Jeremiah, I'm going to give you a new covenant, a new heart, a new mind. And now he's reaffirming that the covenant relationship is going to be back in vogue when he brings them back. Now, it says loving kindness to thousands. If you'll flip over to Deuteronomy 7, 9. Jeremiah is extremely influenced by Deuteronomy, Mosaic legislation. The word thousands there adds the word generations. And I think that's true. Whenever the Bible says he shows loving kindness to thousands, the implication is to a thousand generations. And you say, well, what's the sense of that? When it says uh, the iniquity of the fathers, you can look at Deuteronomy 5, 9, where it says to the third and fourth generation. So compare the mercy and the judgment of God. Love and loyalty and faithfulness to a thousand generations of those who love me. And iniquity to the sons and daughters to the what? Third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Do you get the comparison there? A thousand to three and four. Now, I want to mention about this, the iniquity of the fathers. Uh, Jeremiah in chapter 31, Ezekiel in chapter 18, Deuteronomy in 24. Assert that a man shall stand for his own sins. And that you're not going to be judged for the sins of your father. Then what does this mean here about the iniquity of the fathers? First of all, we're in an oriental society. Many generations lived in one home. It's quite possible that a, a great-grandmother, a great-grandmother, a grandmother, a daughter, and her children lived in the same home. They'd all live together. And so it may be the sins of one generation directly affected three to four generations in one household. Or it may mean that the sinful priorities that we communicate to our children live on in them. If you, what we, it's not what we tell our kids, it's what we show them. 
And we often give to our kids more than we want to in our own lifestyles. It's not how much you say you love the Lord. It's the life that you live that's so important. And many times we communicate the wrong thing to our kids by the way you live. Now, okay, the Lord of hosts, that means the, the uh, Lord of the armies of heaven. We've talked about that before. Uh, great in counsel, mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. There's the ideal about every man, every tub is going to sit in his own bottom. There's the idea of Galatians 6, 7. Uh, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Justice, okay? Giving to each according to his deeds. Who set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, okay? He's going back. Now think of me. There's a massive world empire on the doorstep of the people of God about to brush them off the stage of history. I mean, they're, they're, they're going into exile. Their temple and their beloved city is going to be leveled. And Jeremiah goes back and says, God, I remember the kind of God you are. How with signs and wonders and a mighty arm you brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Another world power. A world power that, ought, that had the children of Israel under bondage for hundreds of years. A world power that there was no way in the sun that Israel, a slave nation, unarmed, unequipped, could get out of that problem. And Jeremiah says, remember God how you did it? You think there's an allusion to the fact of that other world army that's about to take them into exile, that God will bring them back for that too? Oh, I think it is. And didst bring thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror. And the implication is, I'll do it again. Thou gavest them this land which thou didst swear to their forefathers. Now, who did he swear it to? Abraham. Genesis 12. He's still fulfilling that covenant. A land flowing with milk and honey. All my life, as a reader of the English Bible, I thought that was a descriptive term of a fruitful Palestine. A land that had big grapes and lots of herds. But since I have been doing study in some of the other records, like the Assyrian records and the Babylonian records, this is the technical designation of the promised land. Palestine was known in all the records as the land that flows milk and honey. As West Texas would be known as what? The land of dust storms. Kind of. That's the way we're, we're known. That. That's, that's something that happens here. It doesn't happen much anywhere else. Palestine was known as a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, okay. Notice in verse 23. And they came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey thy voice, walk in thy law. Here we're getting the reason for the, for the conquest. The reason for that army out there is... You broke the covenant. You rebelled. Your lifestyle was the pits. You never listened to God. Behold, the siege mounds have reached the city to take it, and the city was given into the hand of the Chaldeans. And the word Chaldeans is a racial term that came to mean a elite group of astrologers or magi and later came to designate the whole Babylonian Empire because of the language. So it's a term that's very fluid that has very specific meanings in the Bible. It means the Babylonians. Um... Look at verse 25. And thou hast said to me, O Lord God, buy for yourself a field of money and call in witnesses, although the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. And you know, I just, Jeremiah is saying, scratching his head saying, Lord, I know you're really something else. <laughs> I know you're great and wonderful, the creator of all the world. You've done mighty things and miracles. And here you are asking me to buy a field right in the middle of them. <laughs> This country about to fall. God, I'm going to do it, but I want you to know I think it's done. You, know? <laughs> you can almost hear Jeremiah doubting, you know, saying, What am I doing? Are you, are you sure I got this right? You want me to buy a field now? Yep, that's right, Jeremiah. That's what I want you to do. In the midst of not understanding and amazement, he does what God wants him to. Now, 26 and down to 44 is really God's reply to Jeremiah's prayer. This is what he says. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord. That's in Hebrew, that would be something that sounds funny. It would be the I am the I am. Because see, the word Lord means I am. And what he's saying is, I am the I am. Exodus 3.14. But 
the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Jeremiah's just been dumbfounded at having to buy this field at a time like this. And God said, do you remember what you just prayed? Is anything too hard for me? <laughs> Trust me, Jeremiah, I know what I'm doing. When it says the God of all flesh, that's a very significant thing. There are so many gods in that day. Polytheism was rampant. Fertility cults were rampant, as we'll see in a minute. But God's saying, if there's only one God, if that's true, if monotheism is true, and He is the creator of all the world, then it's also true that God is the God of all mankind. Now see, that implication has universal significance for God's love and provision for other men. And so the fact that he would, Jeremiah says the God of all flesh, the God of all mankind, is a significant way about saying he's the God of the Gentiles as well as the God of the, of the Jews. You might want to see chapter 10, verse 7, where the same similar phrase is used of God. Is anything too difficult for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm about to give this city in the hand of the Chaldeans, in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take it. And the Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall enter and set this city on fire and burn it. Now that may go back to Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 6, where a Canaanite city had to be purged with fire from its idolatry. And Israel, especially Jerusalem, has become so perverted with idolatry, the same fire that burnt the Canaanite cities out to purify them is the same fire that's going to burn the city of Jerusalem, the temple, out. With the houses where people have offered incense to Baal on their roofs and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Baal, pardon, is the male fertility god? You might want to see verse chapter 19, verse 13 for this. Other gods are offered to on the roof are probably the astral deities of Babylon. These rooftops had become high places to worship these false gods. Archaeological... Uh, discoveries have found the, the presence of little female fertility gods all over the promised land after the period of the judges. Not too many during the judges, but after that, and not just in the sanctuaries, but they found it in the ruins of homes, which seems to imply, and there's so many of them, a naked woman, uh, many breast, symbol of fertility, they have found so many of them that what is obvious happened that the worship of Yahweh has become so intermingled with the fertility cult of the Canaanite religions that it, you can't imagine the pervasiveness of this and archaeology has proved that in the finding of these thousands of little uh, naked female figurines in the land of Palestine this period. Verse 30. Indeed, the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah as both of them split up again have been only doing evil in my sight from their youth. For the sons of Israel have been provoking me to anger by the work of their hands, their idols. Indeed, this, this city, this is Judah now, has been a provocation of my anger and my wrath. And the day they built it, golly, that's what they're saying. God said, I've been upset from the day they built this place where they're at. Even to this day, that it should be removed from before my face, purifies the fire deal again. Because of all the evil of the sons of Israel, the sons of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their leaders, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they have turned their backs to me and, and not their face, though I taught them, teaching them again and again, they would not listen and receive my instruction. When I hear that I taught them, my mind runs to Hosea 11, 1 through 4, where God says, I taught Ephraim to walk. I was the only you know, one that did that. And they turned from me and gone to Baals. Um, but they put their detestable things in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. Can you believe that in the temple itself, shrines were set up to foreign gods? When's the first mention of that in the Bible? You remember when this happened the first time? That I can remember any place. Solomon's wives. When Solomon became old. Let me give you a couple of references. You can look up. I don't think you'll believe it, but you can look them up. 2 Kings 21, 4 and 5. 2 Kings 23, 4. So that's Manasseh. Ezekiel 8. The whole chapter talks about the perversion 
of the worship of Yahweh that had occurred when worshiping so many other gods, even in God's house. And they built high places of Baal. You might want to see, uh, let's see, 731, 19.5. Now, high places were usually low hills. They thought being higher up, being closer to God. Baal was the male fertility god. The most abusive sexual things you can imagine. The book of Hosea is the most explicit. Happened in the name of Yahweh practicing the fertility cult of Baal. That are in the valley that Ben Hinnon and caused their sons and daughters to pass the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. The word Molech is a corruption of the Hebrew word Melech, which means king. Apparently, they worship this god in Yahweh's name. It was a fire god. We don't know a lot about it. But apparently, they, the people offered their firstborn child to that god in, in, in death. Now, you talk about someone being committed to their religion. Would you offer your firstborn child to a God? Now, friends, that's commitment. We found the burial of these children in this valley, in, in, in places. It's unbelievable that these people offered their firstborn child to assure the fertility of the land. God just rails against this. Leviticus 18.21 is one place. It's just... This became the place where when the Jews heard about this, they would spit, the valley of the sons of Hinnon. This is the word that Jesus used to describe eternal punishment, Gehenna. Ge in Hebrew means valley. Hinna, the valley of the sons of Hinnon, where Molech was worshipped, became the garbage dump of the city of Jerusalem, where fire burned all day long. Jesus said the fire never goes out and the worm never dies. He's talking about the local garbage dump. And that's what he used to describe eternal punishment. The Hennites, this place right here, and from the worship of this God, Molech, this fire God. Some people say it had the form of a man and the head of an ox. We don't know for sure. The evidence is just not clear enough to make that kind of statement. Verse 36. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, to which... To which you say, it is given to the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, by pestilence. Those are the three things all through Jeremiah describe a military invasion. The famine and the pestilence come inside the besieged city. You know, in Josephus' day, when the Romans besieged Jerusalem, there are actual accounts of women eating their own children and saving the uneaten part under their bed and eating them little by little, day by day. You say, it never happened to me. You've never really been hungry. Inside the walls of these cities, when those armies came, the neighborhood flooded in. There was not enough water. There was not enough food. There was no facility of sanitation. Disease ran rampant. No place to put the bodies. They just threw them over the wall. Uh, you can imagine the smell, the disease, the horror of a besieged city. I'm not sure you can imagine, but wow. What God said, what the, what the famine and disease doesn't get, the sword will when they finally break in. Behold, I will gather them out of all the land. What a sudden change. From sword, pestilence, and disease, the next verse with no even paragraph break comes, Behold, I will gather them out of the land to which I have driven them in anger and my wrath and my great indignation I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. Promise to restore the city. They'll be my people and I'll be their God. Renewal of the covenant. Those are covenant terms. I will give them one heart and one way. Now the Septuagint has, I will give them another heart and another way. To me, this is because of its close proximity to what other chapter? Where, where would this relate to? Another heart and another way. The new covenant of 3131. I will give them a new covenant. I will, I will give them a right on their heart, my laws. So I think it's referring to that new covenant again. I will give them one heart and one way. They may fear me always and, and for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I think that's very important. Um, 
I was going to mention to you the paradox that I tend to find more and more as I study the Bible. Let me give you a couple of verses and let you look it up when you get home. Ezekiel says this same thing about another heart. In Ezekiel 31, excuse me, Ezekiel 18, 31 is one reference, and Ezekiel 36, 26 is another one. And here's the paradox. Ezekiel 18, 31 says, Make for yourself a new heart. Man's responsibility. But Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I, their God, will give them a new heart. Do you catch the paradox there? They're to make it. God's going to give it. It reminds me so much of that New Testament verse that says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And the very next verse says, But it is God who is at work in you to do His good pleasure. That, that unusual balance of man's responsibility, God's grace and initiative. I think they're both all the way through the Bible. Um, verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from them to do them good. I will put uh, my re the reverence of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. See the, you see God's election? He's going to change their heart. He's going to give them a new heart so they won't turn away. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. Historically speaking, was the return from the exile an everlasting covenant? No. No. Alexander the Great came. All that happened. Rome came. You see, when God makes a covenant, as far as he's concerned, if the people keep it, it'll last forever. If the people were faithful to do what God wanted to do, nobody could take that land. The people who came back couldn't do it. Now, that tells me one thing, interpretation-wise. The promise of a new heart and a new covenant is not completely and supremely fulfilled in the return of the exile. That is the historical illusion. The, the coming back from Babylon is the specific historical illusion to the new covenant, the new day, the everlasting. But we know from the New Testament that the ultimate new heart, new mind, new covenant is the covenant of Jesus Christ, which is an everlasting kingdom. And so I think we're going beyond here what we know happened in history because they fell again and again. If it was up to God, it would last forever. His promises are unconditional. But unfortunately, his promises are conditional of man's response. And the Jews came back repentant for a while, but drifted right back into laxity and were taken out of the land again and again and again. Now, in verse 41, And I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will faithfully plant them in the land with all my heart, with all my soul. That's God speaking. That is an anthropomorphic phrase to show God's intensity of his promise. God does not have a heart. <laughs> It's a way of saying, I'm fully committed to you, Israel. I'm, I'm committed to you, body and soul, would be a way of talking about it. But knowing God doesn't have a body or a soul, <laughs> you see. So it's, a, it's an anthropomorphic phrase. And then 42 and following, notice it says, The Lord, just as I brought this calamity on this people, I'm going to bring on them all the good that I've promised. And the Old Testament, a strange thing for us is, the older parts of the Old Testament make God the only causality in life. Therefore, it's possible for the Old Testament to say, the evil spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. Now, if God's the only cause, then even evil somehow, somehow has to be in God's will. Now, I think it's somewhat here. God says, I've caused this calamity. I've caused this judgment. I've caused you going to exile. But I'll also cause you good. It is a verse that speaks of God being in ultimate control. There is no dualism in the Bible. God and the evil one are not really in a battle to see who's going to win. The evil one, calamity, is in the will of God, is being used by God for his purposes. The evil only exists as God allows it to exist. And I know it's hard for us to understand, but friends... God is the ultimate source. He allows things. He turns even evil into good. He uses hateful nations to judge his people for religious purposes, beneficial purposes. 
And so here's a way of saying, I cause evil and I send good. Um, notice verse 44. He's using this deal about Jeremiah buying this field to say, Men shall buy fields for money, sign, and seal deeds. Call in the wilderness in the land of Benjamin, saying, Things are going to be back to normal again. Trust me, Jeremiah. Things will be back to normal. Okay, uh, questions and comments about chapter 32? Anybody? Yes, John. It must be just a couple of weeks, but exactly how long, I don't know. It wasn't a month or a year. It's just a few days, you know. Oh, no. I, I, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. No, he's, no, he's going to die because it, he's told him it's going to be a long time, several generations, you know, plant vineyards, build houses in Babylon. But I think he's putting that deed someplace so that his descendants, or if he didn't have any, he wasn't married, his family would still have that land one day. And they're sealing that deed to prove that it belonged to the family of Jeremiah.